Hello, I'm Joshua Rosenberg. I'm a legal commentator and I've been invited by Intelligence Squared to present this podcast. Joining me is Chris Daw QC, a barrister specialising in criminal law and author of a new book called Justice on Trial, Radical Solutions for a System at Breaking Point. Chris, we've seen quite a few memoirs by criminal lawyers over the years and We've even seen one or two books by lawyers who think that the criminal justice system is broken. What's, what's special about your book? I think it's the fact that I'm trying to draw together all of the strands in one place. Um, I, it, it's not a memoir, uh, although there are case studies, as you know, and, and examples of the kind of case I've done over a 25, 26 year career as a criminal defence lawyer. But, but what I'm trying to do in the book is really try and hit the main headlines of what's wrong with the system. And many books have done that to, in different ways in the past, as you say, but then draw, draw it all together in a kind of overarching uh, kind of um, polemic, if you like, as to, as to what we can do about it, some real practical solutions as to how we can stop wasting money and stop wasting lives in criminal justice, which sadly I think we just do too much. Well, well let's talk about that because you've subtitled your book Radical Solutions for a System at Breaking Point and perhaps the most radical of these is summed up in the title of chapter two, Why We Should Close All Prisons. All Prisons? Yes, all prisons as we know them now. So my, my um, very strong belief is that the, the infrastructure of prisons, which largely is a, is a hangover from the Victorian era, in fact we still have many prisons um, which are operating, which were built in the Victorian era, such as Strangeways in Manchester and many of the other large uh, city prisons. Uh, and my view is that it's the infrastructure and the architecture of, of those institutions, which actually in many ways perpetuates criminality, which, which creates an atmosphere within the institutions, which really just says to people, you're a criminal and we're going to treat you like one. And unsurprisingly, when you treat someone like a criminal, they come out even more of a criminal than the, than the one we went in. You so, so the my, architecture, but, but I mean, you know, all prisons have walls, all prisons have bars. Some prisons are modern, uh, some prisons are reasonably attractive, they're quite spacious, those uh, out in... Uh, out in uh, out of the city centres, um, are you saying that those are unsatisfactory as well, or is it just the very old ones? Well, it's very interesting. No, they're all unsatisfactory. It's very interesting that you should say that they all have bars and they all have walls. In Britain, that's largely the case, although not completely. Some of the lower security prisons don't have walls, for example, and don't have bars. Um, but uh, in other countries, and I, I talk extensively about a number of other countries from a sort of extreme deep south kind of uh, uh, dystopian nightmare of the prisons of, of the US to the much more pragmatic uh, and progressive prisons of the Scandinavian countries. And in those countries, prisons don't look like prisons as we know them. They look like residential communities. Now, some of them, for, the, for those who are the most dangerous prisoners, have security measures and security fencing to prevent people escaping. But once you get into the secure environment, they try to make the environment look as much like normality, as much as like the outside world as possible. And that's where I'm coming from, because the, the focus of our prison system has always been the clang of the prison gates and locking people up behind these big walls and cell doors and bars. And actually, the focus shouldn't be on shocking and scaring people the moment they go into prison. It should be how do we prepare that person to actually fairly seamlessly move from prison into normal life where they can have a job, they can look after their family. Um, and, and at the moment, we're failing completely on that score because people are just living in this state of alienation in this entirely um, kind of different universe of being prison. And when they come out, they're blinking in the sunlight. They have no idea what to do. And unsurprisingly, most of them commit more crime. Uh, the way, of course, that we do prepare prisoners to be released is by putting them in open prisons. And as you say, there are some prisons where prisoners go out to work during the day and apart from one or two punishment cells that they may have for anybody who uh, disobeys the, the rules before they're chucked out of these open prisons and return to closed conditions, they, are, um, they don't have uh, bars on the, on the, on the doors and you, know, you can walk in and out of them, although obviously you have to return and obey the rules. But you are acknowledging, though, that some prisoners will still have to be behind bars, even if the architecture is better than we have at the moment. Yes, and for me, the important statistic, and I deal with it extensively in the book, is that 69% of those who are in prison today, every day in the UK, are non-violent offenders. So they don't present a risk to the public of hurting people, of committing serious assault or murder or rape. 
they, they are people who have committed crimes often financially driven and often drug related and that's as you know a large chunk of the book revolves around drug uh, policy so yes there is a small minority of the prison population probably 10 to 15 percent who represent an ongoing and immediate risk of harm to the public and they need to be kept in secure conditions but nearly every one of those will be released bar about 60 or 70 who are serving what we call full life uh, tariffs, but, but whole life tariffs rather. Um, and so 99.9% .9 of all prisoners, no matter how violent the crime, no matter if they've committed murder or several murders, the great majority will be released one day. And so even those most dangerous ones, they need to be kept secure, but you still, once you've got them in a secure environment, which can be done through electronic means and of course through fencing and, and the like, that doesn't have to be a great big brick wall to keep people in um, but once they're inside the environment I still believe no matter how serious their crime that they should be treated and that the conditions should be as normal as possible they should have normal living arrangements as much as possible for example to cook their own food in normal kitchens rather than sort of shuffling into a, a Victoria mess hall queuing up for food to be slopped onto a plate the, the sort of conventional image of prisons that's just putting people in an environment which takes them away from the mainstream and makes it harder and harder for them to reintegrate when they finally get out. But what you say is that we should leave those convicted of most crimes in their own homes. You would prefer not to send many prisoners, people who go to prison at the moment, to prison at all. Uh, you would prefer them to be monitored by electronic tags and so on. But as you know better than most people, many criminals don't have homes. And if you didn't lock them up while they were awaiting trial, they'd never turn up in court and they'd never be convicted. Well, I, I don't think we should be using the criminal justice system as much as we are anyway, particularly for nonviolent crime. So, uh, and you're absolutely right that many of those who are in the prison estate and the prison system are in there because they're homeless, because they are addicted to drugs or because they have uh, mental health problems rather than because they are inherently dangerous people who want to go out and commit crime for its own sake. And so you're absolutely right to address the issue that many of those who enter the system, they need care. What they don't need is to be punished to be locked up in Victorian conditions. And, and, and of course, when you do that, and I, I tell the story in, one, in the book of a, of a client, a former client of mine, who, who for the purposes of the book is called Michael. Um, and he'd been in prison for 30 out of his 52 or so years of life. And he told me very clearly, and, and I tell the tale in the book, he said, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't like it on the outside. I only know prison. It's the only way of life I have. And so when, you, when you're spending millions to keep people locked up in institutions only for them to just keep th coming back through the revolving door you've got to ask yourself why what's the point of that um but to answer your direct question so so of course anyone who's homeless shouldn't be homeless so whether they're a criminal or not and if we as a society are accepting that people can be homeless and we just don't care and therefore we'll put them in prison instead of instead of a home then we're clearly getting something seriously wrong because, as you know, it costs 50000 or so on average a year to keep someone in prison. It costs a lot less than that to house someone in the community outside of prison and provide them with safe uh, hygienic conditions and the ability to access health care and, 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 you know, decent living conditions. So if someone's committed a nonviolent crime and they're homeless, then they should be given accommodation, but they shouldn't be sent to prison. Last question from me on prisons. Um, it's almost 250 years since John Howard, the great prison reformer, mm. uh, gave evidence to MPs on conditions in prisons. Mm. And of course, many people have followed him over the centuries. What makes you think that uh, with your book, you're going to be any more successful in engendering a reform of the prison system? Well, it's, uh, it's a good question. And, and I, uh, my concern is actually that no matter how rational the suggestions and I believe that they're really quite sensible and pragmatic they're not even complicated suggestions particularly around drug reform particularly around uh, the, the just to sit the complete failure of prisons to actually produce the outcome that people want which is fewer criminals and less crime that's the point of the criminal justice system and yet the criminal justice system and the, and the, the prisons in particular achieve the diametric opposite of that so all I can hope is that by making an argument and I'm trying to make it passionately but also calmly and clearly basing it on evidence and I've traveled as you know for the book all over the world I've been into prisons in different countries I've looked at court systems I've interviewed judges from from different jurisdictions and prosecutors and defense lawyers and the cumulative evidence that I'm absolutely in no doubt about is that the way we're doing it now is failing 
and that there is a much more sensible way of trying to address crime, which will actually save lives and reduce the amount of victims of crime. And I, I guess, Joshua, the answer is, am I cynical about whether a, a, there's likely to be uptake? Yes, I am. Am I sceptical as to whether the politicians will buy into this? Yes, I am, sadly. But that, you know, I've had 25, 26 years of doing this job, and I think a lot of what I do and a lot of what those of us in the system do is, is really a waste of time because it achieves nothing except making things worse. So I think it's I'm always duty bound to kind of say, well, the emperor's got no clothes. We, we, you know, we, we pay lip service to justice and punishment and rehabilitation, but actually the whole system is broken. And, and, and if my ideas can get people talking, and if we can even get a few steps on the road to a much more sensible, a much more fair and rational system, then, then job done. Um, okay. uh, because at the moment there's very little debate actually around these things. All right, well let's move on to chapter three, uh, which is called Why We Should Legalise Drugs. All drugs? All drugs, uh, absolutely. Uh, and and of, of course, the, the argument I make is not, as some would no doubt um, characterise it, that there's a free-for-all. Of course there isn't. Any more than there's a free-for-all for alcohol or cigarettes, uh, you would have quality controls, you would have licensing, you would have processes and age restrictions and all of the things that go with any licensed uh, intoxicant, uh, wherever that, that might um, um, be sold in the world. Um, but absolutely, because the minute you start to prohibit a substance, you create a black market for that substance. And once you have a black market, that's where chaos reigns. That's where deaths happen. That's where overdoses happen. That's where vi gang violence and turf wars happen in a prohibited market. So you can't, you can't um, uh, 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 as it were, carve some drugs out of legalization any more than you can carve most alcoholic drinks out of the system. I mean, there are very, very potent alcoholic drinks available to buy at 60, 70 percent, 80 percent proof. Um, but you restrict the sale of it and you restrict the licensing conditions around those products. Um, but if you restrict them too much and you make them inaccessible to people who want them, then they, then they will go to a dealer and there will be a black market. So absolutely, I, I, I understand the argument. Some people say, oh, let's legalize cannabis. Actually, cannabis is quite a dangerous drug, uh, objectively. It's not as dangerous as alcohol or tobacco, but it's still a dangerous drug. Um, so I don't, I don't buy into the whole classification. One's better than another. Basically, human beings take drugs. And this is the point I make in the book, as you know. I, human beings have taken, there is evidence that human beings were ingesting psychotropic plants as long as 200 million years ago. And, and, and certainly for, for tens of millions and certainly throughout human civilization for, for the last 10,000 years, you're never going to stop it. And the point I make is if you can't stop something, you need to regulate, license and control the supply of it so that you create safer conditions for those who choose to use it. Now, now you say regulate and control the supply, but if you make drugs legal, then surely more people will take them. Is that right or not? That's not the evidence of any system where there's been a degree of liberalization or a degree of decriminalization. But what we haven't seen actually, other than in a few states in the US and a few other countries in relation to cannabis, what we haven't seen is a comprehensive regulatory and licensing system of the kind that is applied to alcohol. So that you have to have a license to sell it. You have to have a license to produce it. You have to, you can only produce a certain standards. Um, I mean, one of the, th I think they make this point in the book, the, when you go and buy a children's toy, it's subject to 57 different regulations from the EU, from international regulation to every degree of safety standard. And yet a 15 year old child, as I tell the tragic story of Martha Fernback in the book, a 15 year old child can go out on the streets and buy ecstasy that's 91% pure, that could kill a horse. And, and there's no regulation and there's no licensing well, of that product. There's no regulation except that it's illegal. But, but let, 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 let me talk about the age because you say that she was a 15 year old girl. She sadly died. Um, you say you would set an age limit for uh, purchasing drugs legally. Where would you put that age limit? Well, the age, the age limit may vary d depending on the drug. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that 16 or 18 was a logical, is a logical place to start uh, depending on the nature of the drug. Um, but but you, you make a valid point, which is, that yes, of course, under any system, you wouldn't make drugs freely available to 10 year olds, for example. But the no, point but you, I make, you, you say you say 16 and this girl who tragically died was 15. So if she wanted to uh, continue to take drugs as she did, um, then she would have to take drugs illegally. Yes, she would. But the, but the, the product to which she would have access, just like when a 17 year old drinks alcohol, the 17 year old who drinks alcohol doesn't go and take 100 percent volume moonshine. 
they get alcohol that's been bought you know by someone else legally in a supermarket or an off license and they know that it what the, what the product is that doesn't mean it can't make them ill but what they what they can't do as a 15 or 16 year old is go and buy alcohol that will if they take one drink of it will kill them uh, well you, you, that's you, that's the difference yeah but the 15 year old might still uh, be targeted by a pusher who would give her uh, dangerous drugs and under your scheme she would have to get an older person to buy her the drug a parent perhaps older sibling or lie about her age and and and, and commit mm -hmm. an offense so she would just uh, still be t targeted by drug pushers or by people who would sell her drugs more cheaply than she could buy them lawfully surely well, no, if you think about it, so Martha's mother, uh, Anne-Marie, who I interviewed for the book and I, I, I and was a, a really kind of powerful source of, of both information, but also kind of common sense and pragmatism. Martha's mother is in no doubt, and I'm in no doubt, that no, no, in a, in a market where you could go and buy ecstasy tablets or MDMA, at the, at the strength that is the, the strength that users want to take. So it gets them high, but they come down the next day and they're okay a couple of days later. That Nobody wants to take 91% pure MDMA, which will kill you which will instantly kill you. Nobody wants to take that. And no dealer wants to sell that to somebody. But the, the, she, she didn't buy it 91% pure because the dealer intended to sell her 91% pure. The dealer didn't know. That's the thing. You, in, in, the, in an uncontrolled, unregulated market, drugs are mixed up in cement mixers or people's kitchens. So someone's got 0% and someone else has got 91%. If you have a market where the, where the, the dosage is controlled and written on the packet, there is absolutely no incentive for people to buy drugs that have been produced in another way any more than there is a, an incentive for people to go out and buy alcohol that's been produced illegally or, or, or still somewhere. There's a tiny, tiny percentage of alcohol is, is made in that way, but it's, it's insignificant. 99% of alcohol is, that is sold is a licensed and legal product. It may have been bought by someone underage, but at least the product is as safe as it can be and you know what you're taking. And the, and the point I make in the book is if Martha had been 15 and she passed herself off as 18 and she went into a pub, what she couldn't do is buy a drink that she sipped and then dropped dead on the floor. And she was able to do that in this market. Let's talk about heroin. Uh, heroin would be available to heroin users. Uh, would these people be able to hold down responsible jobs while taking heroin so that they could pay for their drugs? Or, or would heroin users... Well, it's a very good question. So, a very good question. So, one of the places I visited in the course of my research was the heroin assisted treatment program in Geneva, and Switzerland has led the way over many, many years. Switzerland had a horrific problem with heroin in the 80s and the, uh, through to the early 90s, where they had people shooting up in parks. They had skyrocketing levels of HIV infection. They had massive rates of overdose and heroin deaths. So they decided to do something about it. And what they did was introduce a number of different measures. But the most radical and the most important one was a heroin-assisted treatment program where heroin users were are able, and I saw them, I visited the center, I spoke to the head of the unit, a psychiatrist, a wonderful psychiatrist uh, out there, and, and they visit the center twice a day. They come in the morning and they come in the evening. And many, many of them, if not the majority, do exactly what you say, which is they come for their heroin in the morning, they go to work or college, they come back, they have more heroin in the evening, and then they carry on with their lives. And, and they the get their heroin. Yeah, I was just going to say, is the heroin provided free for them at, the, at these, uh, at these it, centers? It, 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 well, not exactly. They have a very interesting approach in Switzerland. So the, the Swiss Supreme Court decided that heroin addiction and indeed other addictions uh, were, were, are a disability in law. And therefore, under Swiss law, a disability is something for which you're entitled to very substantial health and financial support. If it's a, a physical disability or a mental health disability or an addiction, they're treated the same way. So what happens is that heroin addicts are given the same medical and social security payments as everybody else who's disabled, who may not be able to walk and may need assistance with, 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 with their life in another way. And it's that benefit, as it were, as a disabled, as a disability, as an illness, which is used to fund the heroin assisted treatment program, which provides the heroin. But of course, heroin, pharmaceutical heroin, which is pure and which has a known dosage and which cannot possibly have any adulterants that, that, uh, or, or be of such a strength that it would kill you, is actually relatively cheap. It's not an expensive product to produce for a government under license. It's only expensive 
when it's sold on the street by dealers who have to have a whole criminal supply chain going right back to uh, Afghanistan or, 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 or the original poppy fields where, 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 the, where the, heroin, uh, the opium poppies are growing, it's because of all the illegality and the need to constantly sell and resell and cut and uncut and so on. That's why street heroin is so expensive. And that's why street heroin users have to commit so much crime. But actually, their dosage costs just a few, few quid a day when it's produced and supplied lawfully by the state because it's not an expensive drug. So, so what happens in Switzerland, what's the outcome? The outcome is straightforward. The vast majority of those uh, patients who go to that unit live a law-abiding life and don't commit crime because they don't need to, because they don't need to go out and commit crime to get their heroin. And the vast majority, I think it's 80% in the end, come off heroin. Because, that, because actually, heroin use is often symptomatic of some other issue in life. It's often symptomatic that someone's in distress or has mental health problems or is in pain. And once they're in the medical system and they obtain their heroin medically, all of those other problems start to be solved as well. And so you see heroin usage over time reduces, there is a, the level of crime reduces, and the overall cost of that system per user is, is a tiny fraction of the overall cost that we spend in this country on, and in the US on heroin users, which of course is mainly criminal justice interventions, health interventions, the cost of, oh, the, the, there, are, there are virtually no heroin overdoses in Switzerland because heroin users have access to medical care, they have access to the drugs that are needed if they do take a little bit too much immediately without any judgment upon them. Whereas in Britain, including some of our major cities like Glasgow, the rate of overdose is absolutely catastrophic. And, and in the States, it's even higher. So, so we're killing people by prohibition. In a country that has legalized and licensed heroin treatment, the heroin user is much safer, and so is the general public. Okay, I've got some broader questions to ask you in a moment, but we're going to take a break now. I'm Joshua Rosenberg. My guest is Chris Dorr, and we'll be back after this short break. Chris Dorr... Your roadmap would be fine if we didn't have to start from where we are now. People turn to crime, people turn to drugs because of the way they were brought up. If you want to move people away from a life of crime, you have to start almost at birth, certainly when they're youngsters. Certainly you have to bring them up in a way that avoids them being drawn into crime, being drawn into illegal drugs you can't really adapt the situation now uh, uh, without changing uh, the whole thing. It's going to take you a, a decade or more of people uh, in this situation before you can actually uh, start to see reforms because it's only the people who you might start to bring up from an early age now who are going to uh, 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 go through with the reforms that you're talking about. Well, obviously, to completely change and radically change the entire approach to criminal justice isn't an overnight thing, and I fully accept that. It would take a decade or more to start to see the full benefits of what I'm proposing. Apart from anything, if you're going to knock down a prison that contains 1,000 or 1,500 people, uh, you've then got to find somewhere else for them initially, or you've got to find some other kind of uh, route out of the justice system for them. So, of course, rebuilding and restructuring the entire prison estate is a massive job, and it would take a decade or more to do that. But there are some easy wins, and drug legalization and licensing is one of the easy wins, because drug, drug use and drug prohibition is behind probably by most estimates, 60 to 70% of the entire criminal justice system. So 60 to 70% of violence, 60 to 70% of property crime, and, so, and of course there's drug crime itself, for which many thousands of people are in prison just for, the, just for the drug crimes themselves. So just by over a, say, one to two year period, probably two years by the time you could do it in a sensible way, to move back, actually, to the system we used to have in England. Before 1971, we used to have what was called the English system, which was that heroin was available from certain doctors, on prescription there were a small number of heroin users there were very few problem users um, and then we criminalized it in 1971 and within a decade there were 300,000 plus people who were addicted to heroin and that was the direct effect as I make the point in the book but but if you reversed that course you would begin to see so so you would stop um, for example you would shut down much of the organized crime network almost overnight I mean uh, big time drug dealers some of whom I've represented some of the largest importers of drugs uh, into this country have been my clients the one thing they all agree on is that prohibition is great for them 
it's the it's it's the only thing that keeps them in business and the, and their absolute worst nightmare is legalization because they suddenly have no source of income anymore so when you think about it that way round you know why is it that big drug dealers are happy with the status quo um it, it does strike you somewhat you know of a of a, at least an alarm bell that should be ringing um but but legalization and licensing of drugs would have a dramatic effect within a to, uh, within a five year time frame it would dramatically reduce the volume of, of of people going through the criminal justice system it would dramatically reduce the amount of crime and violence on the streets and you would see that change very quickly some of the other things i mean you can also move very quickly on on my my other proposal which is to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 10 as it is at the moment i mean ridiculous situation where 10 year old children are sitting in court charged with crimes i mean it's just ludicrous and and, and offensive to anyone who who knows anything about children let alone anything else um but but if you did that if you raise the age of criminal responsibility as they have done in luxembourg and and most other countries have a much higher age of criminal responsibility uh, than us then again you would divert what these children who go into the revolving door of criminal justice from the age of 10 11 12 they would be diverted you'd have to have resources for them but it would be a hell of a lot cheaper to provide resources and youth services than it is to put them in the criminal justice system and leave them there for life i mean it well, it costs millions to have a child go through criminal justice for life let me ask you about that because i attended the trial of john venables and robert thompson the two 10 year olds who murdered 2 year old james bulger in 1993 uh, as you know they were tried in an adult court but they avoided Impressed the adult them. Uh, yes uh, and it was extraordinary seeing them because they they were on raised chairs but their heads yeah. were only just above the level of the dock this was Preston Crown Court a very traditional yeah. court you know it well um, but they they avoided the adult prison system at least Thompson did now as you say 10 is the age of criminal responsibility in England Wales and Northern Ireland Scotland i think is in the process of raising it from 8 to 12 what do you think it That's should right. be it should be 18 in my view um it should be 18 as it is in luxembourg because how can you justify telling a a a, a child you're not young yet, you're not old enough to make a decision as to who you want to be your mp you're not old enough to decide whether you have a drink of alcohol or not you're not old enough to drive a car but you're old enough for us to hold you responsible completely for all of your actions as if you are an adult as and, and we will treat you for criminal purposes as if you're an adult but for no other purpose there's, but there's no other purpose You've represented 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds. Some of them, I think most people would say are pretty mature. They may well be living on their own. Uh they may have uh, one parent at home, but they may not be with their parents at all. Uh surely those people are old enough. Those uh, senior teenagers if you like are old enough to know what's right and wrong and to be uh, uh, to be susceptible to the criminal justice system. I don't agree. I don't agree at all. I don't you are you we have to make a choice as to what the age of maturity and and adulthood is and and all of the evidence is clear. I mean I spent time last year filming a, a BBC series and I spent a, 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 some time in a young offender institution in Scotland. I interviewed the, the governor there who I I talk about the interview in, in the book. And she was crystal clear that the 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 maturation process of of a young man but also young women in a slightly different way um it, it really doesn't fully complete until the early to mid 20s. So the idea that you treat a 15 or 16 or however mature they are on the surface in the same way as you would a 30 or 40 year old uh mature adult again it's just it defies the evidence the evidence is that the maturation process does not really fully complete that doesn't mean that you can't you don't do anything i mean even in a country like luxembourg where as i say you can't be you can't be deemed to have committed a crime at the age of 15 but there are secure schools and they are called schools they're places of education where you restrict the liberty of children who are very dangerous and violent and can't be safe to be on the street but it's all about the mindset it's about once you once you tell a child that they're a young offender they then become an offender and that's what they perceive themselves as and that's how they behave but when you treat them as i was just going to say surely if you lock them up and as you say they would have to be in secure conditions even if they're being taught and so on surely if you lock them up they see themselves as apart from everybody else and they see themselves as being punished simply because they can't go out and enjoy themselves like other teenagers but but it would be in in my kind of ideal scenario there'd be very very few i mean i mean if you think about the point i made earlier about the about the adult prison system there's only a small percentage of that system who are entrenched violent individuals who present an immediate risk to the public there's an even tinier percentage of young offenders in that category and so 
rather than you know having having a, a philosophy that you that you it doesn't you don't distinguish you well, i mean when you go to a young young offense institution it's just a prison they wear prison uniforms they bang the cell doors it's exactly the same as a prison and and that's what that's deeply offensive to me so would if you put them in a secure school that had a secure fence you, they, you would be having a handful for the entire country who would be so dangerous as to need those conditions the great majority of children would simply go to a, 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 a much better form of educational environment, which would allow, which would be specialised around. Many of them are deeply damaged. I mean, you're, there's a very statistic I mentioned in the book that, that, that care leavers are 15 times more likely to go to prison or young offence institutions than other children. And you, you, you say to yourself, well, how, how are we not responsible? Or I do anyway. How are we not responsible for that? You know, we can't. You can't blame these. They're not 15 times more inherently dangerous at birth. We've done something with them in the care system, and their lives as children have been so damaged that they end up having to go through this system. And we actually then entrench it and make it worse by, these... by criminalising them and brutalising them in the in the uh, uh, in the custodial environment. But care leavers are precisely the people who are likely to be homeless. They don't have secure home lives. They couldn't live at home and go to school. So you would have to put them in some sort of accommodation, whether you have a high wall around it or not, because they're the people who need structure, who need support, and who may well need uh, telling that they must be there and they can't go off and, as they would at the moment, if you consider them to be crimes, commit more crimes. I just, I just find the whole language, and I know that you're sort of paraphrasing an argument. I'm not suggesting that you're expressing your own view, but I find the whole narrative around, you know, the need to to to, to lock people up and and and, and the, the mindset of if treating them as if they are inherently evil. And of course, as you know, one of the big themes of the book is that people are not evil. They don't come out of the womb with some different kind of uh, otherness, as it were, some some terrible kind of. Uh, genetic uh, predisposition to criminality. I mean, that's that's well known evidentially, um, and and you just have to stop saying a child is 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 a criminal, and and that's why that that's just my view. And the minute you stop doing that, you will improve the outcomes, and and, how, and that's proved. How do you think this is going to go down with the wider public, who regard uh, the, these people as criminals if they've uh, stolen things or attacked people or assaulted mm. people or even more serious offences, uh, which you, you see increasingly mm. in cases of knife crime are committed by youngsters. Uh, mm. The public think that governments should protect them from the people they regard as criminals. And if you're going to have any success in this, you've got to persuade the politicians that there is some way in which they can persuade their electors that closing prisons, legalising drugs, raising the age of criminal responsibility is actually going to work. It's the voters who don't have any confidence in this. And it's not surprising that politicians, if they want to succeed, uh, are giving people what the people seem to want. Uh, well, you're absolutely right, and that's where we are. Where we are. That's why our system is so catastrophically damaging and, and fails so much. Um, and the, why the U.S. system, which is, you know, uh, many times greater in terms of numbers, 2.3 million. I, I call the the U.S. prison population in the book the city of incarceration. It would be the fifth largest city in America if uh, if it were actually a city. Um, and and and, and the, I, I, I you know I illustrate your point precisely in the book when I talk about an interview that I did with a, a judge who refused to be who understandably was off the record, uh, an elected criminal judge in, in, in Alabama. And I said to him, you know, you've got the, you've got death penalty, you've got, you, you lock away 18 year olds for life without parole, for drugs offenses, not even for violent crimes. Uh, you've got this vast prison population um, and, and whole chunks of your communities in inner cities, which are, have virtually no young black men left because you've locked nearly all of them up. Uh, and, and yet your crime rates, the murders, the, the, the robberies and the shootings and the stabbings are, are hugely off massive levels. And he said, you know, I know you're right. It doesn't work. It's it, it, everything we're doing is completely wrong. I said, well, why the hell are you doing it? It doesn't make any sense. And he said, because if I were to argue for any of the things that you believe in, i.e. that I believe in, then I'd never win election and I'd be out of office in five minutes flat. So, so you're right, Joshua. There's a disconnect between the reality evidence of what reduces crime, which are the sorts of things I advocate, 
and what people instinctively and emotionally want. And I go into the whole history of that in the book, you know, because I go back to, you know, justice in, in Mayan civilizations and Roman times and, 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 and you know, always there is this instinctive eye for an eye mentality. And that sadly, people buy that because it's a very saleable message. It's much easier to sell crackdowns and toughness than it is, hey, hold on a minute, let's listen to a nuanced argument about evidence. People switch off. And, and that's why I've tried to make the argument simple. You talked about my, my, my chapter headings. You know, I'm trying to, you know, give, give the other side a run for its money. Uh, let me uh, bring the situation up to date with uh, the criminal justice system as it is now. We've seen a lot of complaints in, in recent weeks by people who say they've been stopped by the police purely because of the colour of their skin. Uh, do you think something's gone particularly wrong in terms of racial profiling, the way the police operate? Completely. It's been wrong for generations. I mean, it's been wrong for decade after decade. It's, it's obviously, at its most extreme, wrong in the United States. And, and, and there's no surprise to me that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, have been on the streets protesting Black Lives Matter in, in the States. I, I have a, a, a client and, and there's been an, uh, he, he, he's, he was interviewed, I can disclose it because he was interviewed for Channel 4 News recently, a young black bank manager who, who uh, had never been in trouble in his life, uh, was in his mid to late thirties, very successful, had reached quite a high position already in, in one of the major banks. Um, he was stopped in his very nice car, which he paid for out of his very um, handsome salary, almost every month and asked, where's the money for the car come from? And, and, and that experience of young black men, whether they be professionals like him or whether they just be young men who, who are driving around minding their own business, that experience of constantly being challenged about how you can justify just walking down the street or why you've got nice clothes or why you've got a nice car, that is absolutely catastrophic for relations between the police and the community. And, and it leads to this tension and it leads to this uh, sense of injustice and a justified one uh, which which many uh, black and minority ethnic people feel, uh, and, and it's just institutionalised. It was it was shown as institutionalised by the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, and sad to say, it remains institutionalised. Not 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 necessarily at an individual level, but just the way in which policing works. If you're a 17 or 18 year old white middle class boy from a nice area, and you and your mates go out and take cocaine at the weekend, the chances that you will be arrested or stopped or challenged are virtually zero. If you're a young black man walking the streets of East London the chances you'll be challenged are infinitely higher. And that's where it goes wrong. So you end up when you don't have like for like, because one community is treated in a totally different way to another community, even though the act the, their actions are exactly the same. So we have to do something about that. It's really important. Last question. Um, let's imagine you were made Home Secretary tomorrow, or Justice Secretary, mm -hmm. if you prefer. You're I've been quite critical of Boris Johnson, you know. It seems uh, an improbable scenario, well, but I'll, we'll yeah, go with your thought experiment. Well, that's really one of the problems because he remains yeah. Prime Minister and he is not going to keep you in that cabinet post for very long if you annoy him, nor is he going to give you very much money, uh, certainly not much more money than the present incumbents have. And uh, yet he says, well, you know, solve the problems with all the constraints of the voters and the Treasury. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you do? You have to go down some route of drug reform, drug law reform, because it's cost. It's it's an immediate cost benefit. It reduces, so you actually will spend much less money if you if you reform drug laws. Uh, and I don't think, if I, in the uh, inconceivable scenario that I were called upon to serve as Boris Johnson's Home Secretary, I, I don't think. Uh, it would be uh, attractive to him to follow the whole of my um, uh, agenda. In other words, the liberalisation and, and the regulation of all drugs. But I would start with heroin-assisted treatment. Uh, I would start with the licensed and uh, NHS-led heroin-assisted treatment programme. They're starting it in Glasgow in a very small way. So it's coming to some extent to the United Kingdom. I appreciate that's a devolved system and, and, and not under Boris Johnson's command. But I would start by saying, let's at least do something about heroin. Let's go back to the system we had before the 1971 Act with heroin treatment. That would, that would have an enormous impact, and it would have a huge economic and treasury impact, a beneficial impact from the very start. So I'd start to argue around that, and then if I were there long enough, I might start to say, hey, this has worked. Let's look at how we might do it with other drugs. And, 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 and by the way, Boris, how about we just experiment with another form of prison environment and just see 
whether if we if we have prisoners living in fairly normal conditions and cooking their own food and maybe their families can come and stay if they if, if that's considered safe and then they come out and they reoffend at only 20 percent like norway rather than 75 percent as, as as here well hold on that experiment was quite successful and then by the time i started my second term joshua as home secretary and perhaps i've even been promoted by then uh, we might be able to uh, we might be able to to, to to crack on with the rest of my agenda um Christor QC, many thanks indeed for telling me about your new book, Justice on Trial. You can read more about Chris's book in the podcast description. And this and, is it. Uh, there it is on the screen for those of you who are watching. Uh, those of you who are listening can see it on the podcast description where you'll also find a, a link to my new book, which is called Enemies of the People. I'm Joshua Rosenberg, and this podcast was produced by Intelligence Squared.